that is one sour berry. That flavor and smell bring back memories from my childhood. Highbush cranberries are just one of many foods growing on the Tongass National Forest. Picking them and other berries is a very old tradition. People have depended on the forest for food for as long as people have lived in southeast Alaska. Today, some, like me, gather food for recreation. But for many southeast Alaska residents, the Tongass and its waters represent their grocery store. For them, gathering subsistence foods is a necessity and a way of life. We call it subsistence, but for our people it was a way of life. Early on in the season, well, fish for king salmon, put that up for the winter months. Now we're fishing for sockeye. Our people will go out and gather halibut. We'll hunt deer. In the summer months, we'll gather blueberries, huckleberries, salmon berries. Our elders would say that the lifestyle that we have and the food that we eat was more healthier than what, what we buy nowadays in the store. Not too hard going over the park. Easy. You're doing good. Subsistence fishing and hunting provide a large share of the food consumed in rural Alaska, an average of 375 pounds per person per year. Nowhere else in the nation is there such a heavy reliance upon wild foods. But Alaska subsistence is more than just gathering food. Living on the land, living with the land, is the fundamental underlying basis of native cultures. Customary and traditional use is a uh... The Klingit word for that is akusti uh, and atuheni, two, two different things. Our ownership of things and our, our way of life, you might say. That's customary and traditional use. That's something from the past that was brought up. And that definition was given to subsistence. The Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, passed by Congress in 1980, mandates that rural residents of Alaska be given a priority for subsistence uses of fish and wildlife. The federal government manages subsistence uses on federal public lands and waters in Alaska, about 60% of the state. The Forest Service is one of the federal agencies working to provide an opportunity for subsistence ways of life by rural Alaskans, both native and non-native. Basket Bay is one of the places that our people will come and gather their sockeye to put up for the fall and winter months. Like everyone who lives in southeast Alaska, Donald Frank's community is surrounded by the Tongass National Forest. His Angoon home is the only town on Admiralty Island. Angoon residents who subsistence fish in Basket Bay must travel by boat about 20 miles across Chatham Strait to Chichigoff Island. The type of seine we're using is a beach seine. We have a leaded line and, and a cork line, and it's about a 45, 50 fathom seine that we use, and we try to hold it out in the tide and, and wait for the sockeye to move in. When our men tie the seine, they create a, which called a sack or a bag, and the fish will hold up in that mill around it as, it, as they're closing it. And uh, we'll bring the seine in both ends in and start to pull it in and try to close it up before any of the sockeye get out. Man, 50, 50, 25, <laughs> how many is that? 36, 36. There are many streams in southeast Alaska with salmon runs, but there's also a big demand for the fish. You can never have enough sockeye as a subsistence, um, you know, in a household or whatever. You just never have enough. Uh, commercial fishermen can never have enough. They're you know, quite a valued resource. It's very fortunate that we do have the, this um, little bit of influx of federal subsistence money um, that allows us to monitor these runs. One place the monitoring takes place is Basket Bay. That's a location where the Forest Service and Angoon Community Association cooperate on a project to estimate annual escapement. The purpose is to allow 
us, the operators, to get an accurate count of the number of sockeye that have escaped the fisheries that make it up to spawn in this lake system. The Forest Service built the weir and camp, but Angoon residents conduct the on-site monitoring. What they do is they're here on site 24 hours a day for the, the whole course of the run. Whenever a sockeye swims upstream and enters the trap at the face of the weir, they'll count the, the fish out, pass the fish over the weir and, uh, and keep a count of how many go up. We had a five sockeye adult mark, one adult sockeye unmarked, and three dolly water. In fresh water on uh, federal lands, we have, federal government has the responsibility for management of subsistence resources, subsistence fisheries. In actuality, we're very closely tied with the state of Alaska Department of Fish and Game, which has, since statehood, obviously, been managers of the, the resource. So we're trying to work together. These projects are cooperative with Fish and Game and the local tribal folks, as is the management. The federal government uh, has a grant project that goes out and we apply for that as a tribal government and we get that. And that's where the employment comes in of our people, I guess. Also a little training, you know, they're, they're getting interested in also what happens to the resources around them. That's a positive side of this, you know, because we get the information. Whether we get the reports or not, we get the information, people coming in, because we are interested in the resources that happen around us. We don't want this uh, fisheries to disappear. We want it to continue for long term to, to continue to, to, uh, to be able to come here and gather what we need. Probably most households have somebody that comes out and does this gather food for their families. We come out here and we, each one of us sign up for a permit and we have some elders that can't make it out. Well, bring a permit from the elders and they're unable to make it here so we'll take it back and, and share it with the elders. We'll take our fish home and we've gotten uh, our smokehouses ready and people will dry their sockeye, and process it. Some, some of it will be fresh packed in, in jars, some will be smoked and dried. On two or three. Now if we cut it, we would cut it straight down and um, hang it on a pole like this for a, for a day or so till the skin is dry. When we fix fire in the smokehouse, we usually just put a little smoke in there without making it a big fire. If we put a big fire underneath, then it'll cook the meat before and it'll ruin it all. It really helps a lot because we're on low income, fixed income and store prices. We can't depend on the store, so we have to really depend on subsistence. And especially with oil prices now, and it's going to be a tough winter for us. If we didn't have fish to depend on, I don't know how we'd manage. The economies in rural communities are not adequate to support the economic uh, well-being of people uh, in rural Alaska. So subsistence is really important from an economic perspective perspective to help support the well-being of people. Economic reasons are important, but it's also the cultural reasons that I think that have caused Native people to really work to protect their subsistence. What we want is healthy watersheds and healthy runs, and I think with that will come uh, healthy fisheries. And so we do, our goal is to maintain subsistence opportunity and harvest as it's occurred in recent years. Managers of the Tongass National Forest have many responsibilities. Maintaining the environments for the wild foods that people depend on, like highbush cranberry, is one of the more important ones. 
we recognize the importance of maintaining the subsistence way of life, both for today and for all the tomorrows. For the Tongass National Forest, I'm Pete Griffin.